Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's webinar. It's Mary Claire Kennedy again with you here this evening. It's nice um, that we have so many who are interested in this webinar. I will allow the numbers to pick up as usual um, before we get started on this evening's webinar. As usual, this is being recorded and will be made available to you in the coming days after the session. Okay, so I think our numbers are picking up now. Sonia, um, if you could share the introductory slides, we can, we can yeah, get going. Right. Thank you. Hopefully. If you want to put them into presentation mode, if you can, that would be great. If not, it's fine. I can just press on. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I'll just get started. Oh, it's on yet. It's okay. Um, so you're very welcome to this evening's webinar, the title of which is Falsified Medicines Directive Moving Beyond the End of the Use and Learn Phase in Ireland. So this is a particularly relevant and pertinent session um, that we have for you this evening. Um, in terms of domestics, um, as usual, we have muted you as you joined the session and we ask that you remain muted during the session. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Sonia, thank you. Um, you're very welcome to use the chat function, which if you have over your screen, is just at the bottom of your screen and you can use that to ask questions. If you can um, try and keep your questions to the end where we'll, we'll take some time for questions, but if you're afraid you might forget it, um, please do type it into the chat box and we will revisit it at the end. Um, as I said, this is being recorded and will be made available to you after the session, and we will also gather some feedback from you as well through a link that we will share with you at the end. So in terms of our speakers this evening, um, I'm delighted to be joined by Leonie Clark, who's Chief Executive of the Irish Medicines Ver Verification Organisation, and also by John Bryan, um, who is Head of Community Pharmacy Assurance uh, with the PSI and John will, um, Leonie will be presenting this evening and John will join Leonie at the end um, in answering questions as needed. So without further ado, then I'll, I'll turn over to Leonie who will um, share her slides. Okay, I think Mary Claire, someone needs to stop sharing. I stop sharing there yet. Super, thank you. Okay, can everyone see those? Yeah, they've come up, Ilona, yeah. Just with the presenter, okay. Okay, let me just... Okay, so good evening, everyone, and um, I'm very pleased to see so many come along, which I'm actually looking at my own window here, and it's a really lovely evening, so I admire your dedication to the cause of FMD. And hopefully you'll find the session useful and that it will have been more to missing out on the lovely weather this evening for you. So just very briefly, what I'm going to go through in this in session is a little bit about the Pulsified Medicines Directive, where are we at now with it, a little bit about the end of these learn. I also want to finish up with a, a, a discussion about the added value of barcoding infrastructure, which I'll explain that in a bit more detail when I get to it. Then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. And just as I get to the end, I have included a lot of extra information, backup slides, which you'll get when they're sent out to you along with the recording, because really the challenge with this session is trying to decide what to leave out as, as much as what to include. So I've tried to strike a balance between practical information about end use and learn to help you with that, but also giving you a broader view of what the whole FMD project is about, and also then the added value piece that I will come to at the end. Um, maybe just at the start, just to say I'm, I'm slightly hoarse at the moment, so I'm hoping my voice will keep up any problems hearing me. Just let me know and I'll just talk a little bit louder. So first of all, what is the Falsified Medicines Directive? And in some ways you might say, why are you saying all of this to us three years down the road? I think it's important to understand the whole regulatory framework around the requirements that you're having to implement. Because certainly, um, it, I find it quite interesting, a lot of pharmacists seem to think we've made them up in IMBO or that they've been made up in the Department of Health or in the PSI, and I suppose that's absolutely not the case. Um, what we're talking about when we talk about the Falsified Medicines Directive is a 2011 directive. So um, this legislation was passed 11 years ago at European level, 
to introduce measures to tackle the growing threat of falsified medicines. And there was a number of measures introduced at the time. One, a requirement for obligatory safety features and outer packaging of in medicine. So that's unique identifiers in the 2D barcode, as you see on the left right hand side there, and the anti tampering device. Now, there was time in set aside to allow the details of how that would be done to be worked out. But the basic requirement to have those things in place and to have medicines authenticated before being supplied to patients was introduced in 2011 in this directive. You'll also be aware that the Falsified Medicines Directive introduced a common EU-wide logo to identify legal online pharmacies and medicine retailers. And you'll be aware of those of you who sell medicines online or on that register that the PSI operates this, and you have the little logo there in the bottom right-hand corner on your website so that people can click on it and check that the red, you're on the register with PSI. There were also tougher rules introduced on the controls and inspections of the producers of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Previously, the focus would have been on the control of finished products, where it was realized, actually, if you want to really cut falsified medicines off the source, you really need to look at the active pharmaceutical ingredients, or APIs. Additional requirements were introduced for wholesalers, including extra record keeping, and for example, the requirement for batch numbers and invoices came from this as well. What we had then, after a number of years' discussion about safety features, pointed the directive of how this was to be implemented. We had a regulation published in 2016, commonly known as the Delegated Regulation or DO. And that spelled out exactly how these requirements were to be implemented, and it also spelled out the legal responsibilities of all the parties involved. So the medicines verification organizations, the manufacturers, the NAHs, the pharmacists, the wholesalers, hospitals, anyone who was involved in the medicine supply chain. This piece of legislation describes how they are to apply safety feature requirements. So I suppose the question was, why was all of this necessary? And um, there is a significant problem with legal, in legal medicine work. And WHO would estimate that 10% of medicines in low and middle income countries are substandard or falsified. The HPRA, it would also, it's constantly looking out for falsified medicines and other illegal medicines and detained up to 1.6 million dosage units in 2020, which was up nearly 60% from 2019. And they would have seen for the first time some illegal COVID medicines. Now, most of these medicines, in fact, all of them are coming through the illegal supply chains. They're coming through internet sales and so on. There's very little hard data on the number of falsified medicines in the legitimate or the legal supply chain. But I think with the falsified medicines directive, it was realized that action was needed to strengthen and harmonize the controls to prevent the introduction of falsified medicines in the supply chain. So the falsified medicines directive was primarily a deterrent as distinct from fixing the problem that was there already in the legal supply chain. FMD in Europe, it's also part of a global move towards serialization and traceability of medicines to protect the supply chain from falsified medicines, and also then to explore the uses of barcodes to improve patient safety and business efficiency. Now, a colleague who works in one of the pharma companies shared this very nice graph with me, which gives you an idea of what barcoding and traceability is looking like globally. So the countries that are in orange, they already have traceability live. So you can see most of in Europe is there. The ones that are in blue, they're working on it. And interestingly, you see the UK, for example, they've left the EU FMD system apart from the Northern Ireland piece, but they actually have legislation in place to pretty much introduce the same type of system again. So we're not quite sure when exactly that's going to happen, but it's really a sign that they realized this had to continue, even though they've gone away from the legal EU requirement to have FMD in place. And then in the countries that are slightly darker blue or teal there, they do have standards activity related to use what's called GS1 standards, which are barcoding standards. They're not specifically serialization or traceability related, but they are about using those barcodes for purposes in terms of business efficiency and patient safety. So FMD is not an isolated thing that Europe has introduced. This is part of a global movement towards serialization and traceability of medicines. And I think I see a lot of commentary about let's get rid of FMD and let's push back. I think when you look at this map, that's not going to happen. I think Europe now has got to a point where FMD is almost fully implemented. And the idea that they will roll back on that when the rest of the world is moving down the serialization track, it, realistically, it's not going to happen. So just I want to talk about some of the key requirements for the repository system. 
um, that were set out in the delegated regulation. So first of all, the systems were to be set up and managed by what they call non-profit entities established by manufacturers of products with safety features. So that's basically ourselves and my MVO. It's also, there's an MyMVO in every country in Europe. We also then have the European Medicines Verification Organization, which is an umbrella organization, and we all feed into that network. Um, so basically, the manufacturers were required to be involved in those organizations. So here in Ireland, we have IPHA representing research-based companies. We have Medicines for Ireland representing the generic companies, and we have AIPPD representing the parallel distributors. The wholesaler and the pharmacy organizations, the delegated regulations said they could participate in these national medicines verification organizations on a voluntary basis, and that's what's happened pretty much across Europe. So here in Ireland, we have the IPU, and we also have the Pharmaceutical Distributors Federation as part of our membership. The delegated regulation also said that the cost of the system is performed by manufacturers. It also said the product has to be decommissioned by the party who takes it out of the supply chain. And there's various decommissioning actions that you can do. So the most common one is marking a pack is supplied or dispensed, but also destroyed, locked or quarantined, withdrawn, recalled, sampled. So if you gave a sample to a PSI or a HP Ray inspector during an inspection, you would mark it as a sample and export it then as something that wholesalers use. But interestingly, what the legislation also said, and I know this is a particular bone of contention for some community pharmacists, the legislation said that healthcare institutions could decommission packs as supplied at any time after receiving the pack in the hospital, but pharmacies must do so at the time of supply to the public. So we're contacted from time to time wondering could we give a derogation against this requirement? We, we can't because it's part of European law. It's, it, that's where the requirement comes from. It's not anything that's been defined nationally or by IMVO. Wholesalers are not required to verify all packs. Again, that's one point that's often made when if we buy our packs from legitimate wholesalers, why can't we rely on their verification? They are required to verify all returns and all packs that they get from anyone other than the manufacturer of the MAH or the manufacturer MAH is contracted wholesaler. In reality, most of the packs that come in the doors of the big wholesalers, they are not required by you to verify. So many packs go through wholesalers without ever being verified by wholesalers. And that's aligned with the legislation. So therefore, the, the whole idea of the falsified medicines directive was to bring the decommissioning and checking of the pack as close to the point of supply to the patient as possible. The delegated regulation also requires to protocols in place to deal with exceptional events, including alerts. And one thing that's important to note, the system is not a track and trace system. And it, again, going back to the point I made that not every wholesaler will verify every pack that goes through their doors. It's simply, um, a, a system that allows you at any point you have that pack in your possession to scan it and check that the pack is okay and you're also then able to decommission it if you're taking it out of the supply chain. Auto trails for packs are only accessible if there's a potential of falsification alert. So we can't go in and see what scans you're doing, we can't go in and see what transactions you're involved in. We only get that auto trail if there's been an alert. With very tight rules and on access to and the sharing of the data in the repository. So, for example, IMBO can in suppliers sell pharmacy data to MAHs. And again, that's one of I read frequently. So we're simply not allowed to do that by law. Just very briefly to give you an overview of the European Medicines Verification System. So basically, what it is, it's a central hub that links up all the different national systems in all the EU member states and then in the three EEA countries. Now, Italy and Greece have not yet joined the European Medicines Verification System. They have a derogation until 2025 to do that because they already have existing serialization and barcoding systems in place. So they have to transition from their old systems to their new systems. But every other country in Europe is required to be involved. At national level, then, so our national system is connected to the European hub operated by ENVO. And then nationally, we have pharmacies, hospitals, and wholesalers connected to the national systems. Pharmaceutical manufacturers and parallel distributors, they upload their data to any of the national systems via the European hub, and the European hub then sends the data to ourselves. So the system in Ireland is known as the Irish Medicines Verification System, and we're one part of the bigger ENVS, or European Medicines Verification System. So this is the big question we're always asked. Have any detect falsified medicines been detected by the ENVS? So here in Ireland, we haven't had any falsified medicines identified to date. However, keep in mind, we are in use and learn and not all alerts have been fully investigated. So we don't know where someone missed. We think probably unlikely. Similarly, we are aware that not all packs are being scanned. For those reasons, we, uh, there have been um, falsifications identified. It may not be even if we'd scanned every pack and investigated every alert. 
There have been a couple of incidents recently in the Czech and Slovakian national systems where they have identified falsified medicines at wholesale level. So that's probably the first example um, of the system identifying the medicines. It is important to bear in mind that the EMVS is designed primarily as a deterrent and that if this objective is achieved, in reality, low detection rates will be the norm. You will find very few falsified medicines in the system because Fortress Europe will be perceived by counterfeiters as a place not to come with your counterfeit medicines. They will go elsewhere with them. And I suppose the best way to think about the whole EMVS, it's like a house alarm. You're putting something around your house to deter the burden from breaking in. You hope the alarm won't ring. And you, won't, you don't measure the success of your alarm by the number of times that it goes off. You measure by the fact that you don't get broken into and your alarm doesn't go off. So if you think about the EMVS like that, I think that's the most suitable analogy. So a little bit about roles and responsibilities, because again, we hear a lot of different um, impressions. Certainly, um, a lot of people seem to believe that IMBO is an enforcement body, which we're not. Um, and I, what I want to do in the next couple of slides is set out who's responsible for what under legislation. So our job is to set up and manage the IMVS and to ensure it operates smoothly as part of the larger EMVS. We also support pharmacies, hospitals, and wholesalers. And I will use the term end users on occasion in this presentation. That's what we mean. So these are people that are connected to our national systems to verify and decommission tax. So we support them to connect to the system and assist with any problems that arise. We work with end users and MAHs to minimize avoidable alerts. And we're also required by the delegated regulation to provide for the immediate investigation of all alerts that represent potential incidents of falsification and ensure that the HPRA, European Medicines Agency, and European Commission on Notified Should Falsification be confirmed. But that doesn't mean we have to carry out every single investigation. And in fact, it's not possible for us to do that because we need the cooperation of end users to find out what's going on in the pharmacy when an alert has been generated. We need information from MAHs. And in fact, what's written into our national guidance, which I'll refer to later on, is that if we don't get the help that we need from either end users or MAHs to ensure that an alert can be fully investigated, then we would escalate it to the relevant NCA or National Competent Authority, as we call them, to follow up. So say, for example, an MAH isn't cooperating with, with us and we can't find out what's going on with them, we would report it. We're, at, we're required to report it to the HPRA. And similarly, if we don't get cooperation we need from pharmacy side to make sure find a root cause for an alert, then that's something we would be required to escalate. But the detail of how exactly that's done and the situation with we would do it has yet to be worked out the detail. But we, you know, our hope is pharmacies will get very few alerts. They'll help us with the alerts. Certainly we found pharmacies very helpful so far that we've dealt with. Same with MAH. So we anticipate that it should all work pretty smoothly. The Department of Health, then, that's another key player. They're responsible for legislation policy relating to safety features for the scope for national decisions. So there is, um, in 2019, there was a medicinal products and safety features regulation passed to set out some of the pieces where in the delegated regulation left things up to member states to decide. So the, the department looks after the legislation. They're also accountable to the EU Commission for any non-compliance with EU legislation. So like any other piece of European legislation, the European Commission will monitor compliance with it. And if it believes that there isn't sufficient compliance, it will deal with the governments in the member states to inquire why have you not done it, what action you've taken to deal with it. So just be aware that that's in pressure comes down from the European Commission to make sure we follow this legislation. The National Competent Authorities, this is the term used in the delegated regulation, as a term often used in European legislation. And basically, these are the bodies who are responsible for supervising the IMVS and ensuring that all parties, end users, MAHs, manufacturers, and IMVO meet with their obligations. So the HBRA is responsible for manufacturers, um, sorry, that should be MAHs, marketing authorization holders, wholesalers, and IMVO. So we will, for example, be subject to um, HPRA inspection. PSI then oversees retail pharmacy businesses and pharmacists, so there are actions in relation to um, the falsified medicines directive. Within the HSE then, um, the HSE really, I think in the early days of FMD, struggled with how they were going to manage this across all the different sites, but actually what they did was, it's actually a very good model of doing a hospital implementation. They actually set up a central FMD project team. They sourced a single system, a single provider with really good support in place, and they rolled it out consistently across all the public health service locations. So they're still working away, making sure they monitor scanning rates in the hospitals, they look at alerts, and they're very proactive in terms of implementing all of it. 
So where are we now with all of this? So this was all went live, became mandatory in 2019, and we're now three years down the road. So where are we? So as you're aware, we're still in the use and learn phase. And the decisions about this use and learn phase are made by a group called the Safety Features Oversight Group, which comprises ourselves, the HPRA, ESI, the DOH, HSE, and Private Hospitals Association. Now, the HSE and the private hospitals are included in that group because they're not represented within the info network, so just give them a voice in. So my job, as well as chairing that group, is I also bring the perspective of pharmacies, in wholesalers, in, and manufacturers to the table. So we meet regularly to uh, review progress with FMD in Ireland and Europe. So I'm talking we meet every two months, roughly, and we look at what's happening here. We look at alert rates, scanning rates. We look at what's going on across Europe. Um, a decision was made um, in early 2009 to go for use and learn phase of FMD in Ireland to allow the, time, the system time to settle and to gain a greater understanding of alerts and how to manage them. Now, you'd be aware that there has been an obligation to scan alerts, a PAC, sorry, during use and learn, but the PACs could be supplied if there's an alert, assuming there's no reason to believe the PAC is falsified. The use and learn phase is now due to end on the 30th of May. We had a number of um, earlier plans to implement or uh, ended sooner, but they had to be deferred. First of all, Brexit came along in late 2019. There were concerns about the impact of Brexit on medicine supplies, which was felt that wasn't a good time to end the use and learn period, which could potentially lead to more problems. Then we moved into 2020, and as you know, COVID hit, and obviously that was a huge disruption across the entire medicine supply chain, particularly in community and hospital pharmacy, and I would say wholesalers as well took quite a hammering. Um, so like, there was just no question of doing it in 2020. So we started again then in 2021, but again, we had to postpone it again um, because of the way COVID went. And we also had Brexit again became an issue in late 2020. So we're now coming up to the 30th of May, and we're now coming to the end of the use and learn phase, so three years after it started. So a little bit about alerts for the next few slides. So the alert rate has fallen substantially in recent months. And in fact, for those of you who have noticed that the red, amber, green colour coding went on in community pharmacies and, in, and hospital pharmacies at the end of February, we found that actually had quite an impact. So it really seemed to make people aware of what they're doing and the alert rate fell after that. It's running at a rate of between 0.07 and 0.9%. In, that's the percentage of alerts versus total scans. We're working to get that rate down to 0.05% lower by addressing all the root causes. So there's many reasons why you get alerts in things like scanner not working, software, procedure errors, data upload, system issues. Now, obviously, in IMVO, we can't do all these things ourselves. So, for example, if there's a problem with the scanner, pharmacy has to take action themselves. Similar to this problem with software, we will work with the pharmacy, but also we will talk to the software providers. So I know, for example, this week, I've been in contact with the managing director of one of the software providers by two pharmacies that are causing a lot of alerts because we've had a, we've just had not been able to get them sorted out. Procedural errors, things like double decommissioning, you know, that's something that's within pharmacies' control to stop double decommissioning because that is leading to alerts. Data upload by MAHs is much less of an issue now. They are getting, they tend to get their data right now, and we see relatively few problems with that. And system issues, we've one going on at the moment with an MAH that's resulting in their data they've uploaded but hasn't landed in the system. So we're currently sorting that one then, but again, they're relatively unusual now. I think one important thing that we've heard from all our other NMVO colleagues, we work very closely with all the other NMVOs across Europe. And the feedback we get from those first stabilization periods of so they use the term stabilization period instead of end of use learn. They say that it, the alert rates fall. And typically in countries where stabilization periods have ended, their alert rates typically are running at 0.01, 0.02%. They go right down because people are aware things like double scanning, things like scanners not working has consequences. They're more inclined to deal with them. So, you know, I think that's something in, to be aware of that the alert rate will improve when we get out of the stabilization period. We do look at European data. Now, the most recent data we have is from the most recent ever producers of a, a quarterly monitoring report is one due next week, but unfortunately we didn't have it for tonight with more recent data. But in that report, the overall rate across Europe is 0.18. It didn't sign down zero, I think it's just because there's so few scans, it's, it's minimal, you know, we round it down. And our colleagues in Northern Ireland today have the highest alert rate at that stage. So if we look at the trend of the alerts this year, you can see they're generally trending down in, over the in, the last few months, which is very positive. If we summarize what's been happening with alerts, um, the entries of alert rate has been improving steadily since the start of the year. So what we do is we measure the overall alert rate and then we look at what alerts are caused 
by in end user locations when a firm is your hospital or wholesaler scans. The overall alert rate has been slightly higher in the last few weeks due to alerts arising for NAH and wholesaler transactions. And it's important to note these don't have any impact on pharmacies or hospitals. So these aren't going to cause any problems in terms of patients um, getting medicines or delays. So that's why we don't get panicked when you know, a wholesaler can have a scanner that doesn't work for now and that can cause 300 alerts and put up the alert rate by 0.02 or 0.03 percent in a week. That's not something that has any impact on you because they just fix that scan and they rescan and everything's fine. The main causes of alerts by pharmacies and hospitals are the decommissioning of bulk and split packs and dispensing. So that's something we really just remind you, just come up with some sort of a way of knowing that a pack has already been opened, don't decommission it again. We see a lot of alerts with decommissioned borrowing. So people borrow packs from other pharmacies and they seem to be decommissioned already. They decommission them again and that generates an alert. We also see, um, you would have been aware at the end of February, wholesalers from that date were required to um, not put back into stock any decommissioned packs sent back to them. The idea of that was basically to stop these packs going back out in the supply chain, generating more alerts in pharmacies. We're still seeing a few of those packs that came back before the 28th of February in circulation, and we expect over the next few weeks that they will diminish. So we would expect very, very few alerts as after the 30th of May. Now we've seen a few problems with exempt medicine products. These are products come into Ireland. They're being we've seen particularly with some of the HRO product, HRT products that have come in. Unfortunately, due to an error in a wholesaler outside Ireland, they were marked as exported. So they're actually coming up with alerts where they've been scanned here. Now we're in contact with the HPRA to decide what sort of communication is needed about this because it's quite unfortunate that an error in a wholesaler in other countries is causing alerts here, particularly when these products are in such short supply and you know there's so much public focus on the supply of HRT. So again, we're going to talk to the HRA to see what we can do about that. Um, and the other thing is late upload. Sorry, I think I'm muted. We, we yeah, literally just lost, lost you for 10 seconds there. Yeah, I was yeah. muted. I came up that I was muted for some reason. Yeah, yeah it sure happened there. Sorry. No problem. Um, late upload of data by MAH just happens from time to time, but it's less of a problem. And in fact, that's often picked up at wholesaler level because a lot of the primary wholesalers, even though they're not legally required to scan packs of goods inwards coming directly from MAHs, a lot of them do it. And if MAHs haven't uploaded data at that point, that will come through as alerts to us. Um, but again, we've had communications with MAHs about um, managing all of that. And the HPRA has intervened on many occasions with MAHs in where they're slow to deal with data issues. Okay. What I've shown you a lot of information there about alerts, but I suppose one key message I want to get across to you is people think, gosh, there's an awful lot of alerts. I'm going to be swamped with alerts with this all ends. The reality is not actually the case. Um, we've done a bit of analysis in-house, and what we've identified is we kind of looked at the number of alerts that people got in March 2022. So we took the 1,890 pharmacies in the, and the ones that reported alerts, and we said, right, how many of them reported how many alerts? So if you look at the, at the bottom of the chart then we work up, 50% of pharmacies had no alerts in March and 90% of pharmacies had four um, alerts or less during March. And it was interesting, we did a webinar uh, two weeks ago for um, HSE sites and one of them said, oh, I, oh, I only ever see green, I never see any red or amber. And actually she just never got any alerts. So it's entirely possible if you've got the scanner and the software working and you don't keep a double decommission, you won't get any alerts. So keep that in mind, you're not necessarily going to get lots of alerts that you're going to have to deal with. And that's just presenting it slightly graphically. So um, we had some pharmacies, like if you look at the very end of that graph, there's some one pharmacy got 146 alerts. That would be a scanner or a software piece, it's just not working. We can pick those up really quickly and intervene and get them sorted out and get people back on track. So I think my key message to you is don't panic that you're going to get lots of alerts. If you get the basics working, Actually, you should have very few. This whole thing is not going to be a huge problem in hassle. Our scanning rate has been improving since the start of the year. And what we have here is we see little dips. It looks like, gosh, what happened that week? That was actually St. Patrick's week. This was a, the, let me see, that was Easter. And this was the Maybank. 
We tend to see in the weeks off um, bank holidays, there's a dip. We're running at about 1.5 million scans a week. So a lot of pharmacies and hospitals are doing a lot of scanning. Just to be clear about that, I know there's a lot of people saying there's not a lot of scanning going on there. But the reality is there is a lot of scanning going on. Now, not all of this scanning is decommissioning because, for example, we know if you're using the McLaren system and you're using the thing with the bag label to decommission, each of your verification scans when you scan the individual packs generates the transaction. And then your bag scan, if you've got five items in the bag, but the bag scan will actually generate another five transactions. So the scanning rate will always be higher than the decommissioning rate. The same with wholesalers doing returns, the same with people marking packs as destroyed. So they're not decommissioning as five scans. So we would expect, we're definitely short of where we need to be. And Envo actually produced a report where they monitor um, the decommissioning activity. So what they do is they measure the number of successful transactions in, of decommissioned for dispense per country in comparison to the average market size per country per week. Now, this is the most recent data we have available from them. Our market size is about 106 million packs. That's IQBA data. And if you look at this graph, now you might say, well, why are some people above 100 percent? Because you're averaging it out. So by the end of the year, it should all come in average out to zero. But in a lot of countries, they are at very substantially high decommission rates. We are not. We're on this side. So in week um, 6, 7th of February, we were at 45% decommissioned. That means off all packs that were potentially sold in the market that week, based on an average figure, we were roughly decommissioned half of them and a little bit better than in week 8. The highest percentage we've seen so far has been 53.3%. So we certainly believe that there is a shortfall in the decommissioning. And the difficulty we have with this figure is this report is sent by Envo to the European Commission. It is sent by Envo to all the national competent authorities. This report has been watched very closely and you can see we're on the wrong side of the table. We need to be up here. So the reason you're seeing a lot of activity from the PSI in relation to scanning is because of the fact that we're at this end of the table. And definitely the scanning is getting better. And as we know, lots of pharmacies are doing a lot of scanning and scanning everything. But unfortunately, it's not across the board and that's showing up in this data. And this is the output offer from our perspective. Envo was asked by the Commission to develop what they call a critical country list based on country performance where the monitoring report. And there's 11 countries on that list, including ourselves. And we're on it because of the decommissioning piece. And our alert rate before Christmas was a little bit high as well. That has come, so that we're, we're no longer being featured because of that. It's the decommissioning activity. So we've been required, I've been required to explain the actions been taken to address the low decommission rate, and that's the PSI activity, because PSI is in the enforcement body. And I've also had to present on these actions at Envo workshops for national competent authorities and the commission. And if I go back to this slide, you see things like our French colleagues are very low, and this is because the French pharmacies basically haven't connected. The European Commission is now in direct discussion with France and enforcement proceedings are not being mentioned because the commission said it can't continue. So there is a lot of focus on countries that are not performing per this critical list. So it's, you know, the pressure will continue to come on the Department of Health and on the HPRA and the PSI to make sure Ireland is doing what they have to do. So moving on then to the end of use and learn. Um, just where we're at, as you know, it's a phased approach. So we're currently in phase five. So this is the stage basically where everyone gets to try out their management procedures. And we did a little pilot back in April. <coughs> It's now open to anyone who wants to start piloting alert handling to do it. And we're very happy to work with any of you who want to start investigating alerts to see how you get on. Um, phase uh, six was the end of using learn for wholesalers to everything. So they're now completely out of using learn. That um, happened on Monday for them. And then uh, the 30th of May is the date for everyone else. So what does the end of using learn mean for in pharmacies and hospitals from the 30th May will not be able to supply a pack that generates the alert unless the alert has been fully investigated and a root cause has been found and falsification in root out. So how will you know what the um, issue is? So basically RefMD software will tell you and it will provide you with a link. You'll be able to click on the link in your software into a help page on our website and that will walk you through how to find the root cause of the alert. We'll tell you if you can fix it and how to do this. The other thing is we're constantly looking for large numbers of alerts in the system. So if we see in your pharmacy all of a sudden lots of alerts, or we see across a number of pharmacies using the same software provider, lots of alerts, or if we see a batch with lots of alerts, we will follow up as appropriate because not only can we fix those alerts, but we can prevent future alerts. 
In, we've produced alert management guidance to describe the process for handling alerts. And I suppose um, I'm conscious I'm, uh, I want to sort of get through a lot of this. I want to um, cut, cut down a bit of the presentation of some of these slides. But very briefly on this, this guidance is all about the fact that an alert doesn't mean a pack cannot be supplied and just has to be binned. It means something doesn't match and you have to look into it and find out what's going on. And the objective is to ensure that alerts are quickly investigated and closed out when root cause is found, and that allows the pack to be supplied with return sale of the stock. And we're giving you the power yourselves to do that. You don't have to wait for us to come back and say it's okay. You don't have to wait for the HQA. What we've done is rather than have you read the detailed guidance, the help pages is based on what's in this best practice doc or in this alert management guidance. So if you look at those help pages and you follow through, it'll tell you what to do in, with a particular alert. You, all, you know when you get in, you scan, you get red, amber, green response. So just to flag to you that red and amber basically indicate that some sort of a mismatch. Now, not all of these are what's called potential falsifications. So the potential falsifications are the so-called level five alerts. So these are the ones where there's a genuine concern that the pack could be falsified. It's not definite that it's falsified, but it is an indicator that one of the root causes might be falsified. You will be able to denote these alerts. They will have the phrase, an alert has been raised in the text, and they'll have a, a, what's called a unique alert ID. These are automatically notified to ourselves, to the MAH of the product, and also the HPRA get them. And these have to be investigated to rule out falsification. Now, on this slide, I've given you a few examples of level five alerts. I'm not going to go into the detail here, but I'll look at the first one maybe. So we get an alert batch not found. So what's the likely root causes? It'll be a scanner or software issue of the data not uploaded by the MAH. So what you do is you follow the advice in the alert help. If you can't find a root cause, you set the pack aside until you hear what the MAH has come up with. You have to keep the pack in the pharmacy or the hospital until the MAH or the HPRA advises you what to do next. And that's HPRA has said that's what's to happen. And you contact ourselves if you need any further assistance. I've also given you some samples then of the other exceptions that you might find. And the, the first one there is product code not known. So if you've scanned something like a, a medical device or an OTC, you'll get that. The batch has been recalled, you'll, you'll get a, a non-level five, but you will have to act on those. And again, just follow the advice in the help pages link from your software. <coughs> so one of the things that um, during the alert investigation, you're looking at the alert, the MAH gets the alerts, they're also looking at them, particularly if they look like they're data related. It's important if you find a root cause that you make the MAH aware of this, and I'll tell you now how you do that, so they can stop the investigation. If you can't find a root cause, you need to know what their investigation is. So they will be able to, we need a way for them to communicate back to you what they've found and whether the pack is genuine or not. If the root cause is not obvious, we'll say they can't find a data problem or something wrong with the system. They may want to request a photo of the pack from you or ask for the pack to be returned. Now, if they want the pack returned, they will tell you exactly how to do that. It may be via the wholesaler, they may send a courier, but they will tell you what way to do it. So it's important you just don't send it back to the wholesaler as part of normal returns. That really makes things very tricky for the investigation. NFBS alerts is we have um, ourselves and 10 other companies are using what's called a thing called NMS alerts. It's an alert management system and rolled out to support communications about alerts. So it's a web-based tool. So effectively, you get a link to a website that gives you a page about the alert, it shows you what we've said about the alert, it shows you the information that the NMH has put in. It's free, it's web-based, you don't need any software for this. The idea of this is that it facilitates efficient handling of alerts, it allows end users, MAHs and IMBO to see the current state of the alert based on the information entered by other parties, to quickly communicate with other parties about their own investigation activities. So in the little box for end users, you can put a little note to say, in, we accidentally, our scanner wasn't working and we've configured it and it's fine again. So then the MAH will know that it's not a data issue, they can close it. It also allows you to maintain a record of your own actions or findings for each alert. So that's useful if you decide to spike the pack. So for example, if you've marked in there, I double decommissioned the alert, I, I scanned it several times. You can mark in there, that's what I've done, and you can go ahead and spike the pack. But you, it's useful to keep a record of what you did so that if there's ever a question mark over that decision spy you have the backup. The details of how to access NMS alerts is available in the backup slides, and we also have a video on it. Now, there's a new version of it being launched in about a week, and we're going to send a video out to everyone, a very short video, five minutes on how to use it, showing you the new screens. So the alert management guidance strongly recommends the use of NMS alerts by all parties, as it's the most efficient way to communicate. 
if you choose not to use it and that is your choice we will have to talk to by phone or email and that's going to be a bit slower and it's going to take longer and it may take longer to sort out alerts so this is kind of a summary of everything to do with the scan and i'm not going to get into the detail of that now again it's something you can have a look at after so it goes into the green the amber the red what you do and how you manage it all now, one of the questions we get is, should I report alerts to the HPA? So no was the answer. So you don't report alerts to suspected quality defects. The only time the HPA is informed is if the pack is found to be falsification. So if the falsification has been confirmed. And actually what we've agreed in Ireland is that the MAH will notify the HPA. And if we keep an eye that they've done it, and if they haven't, then we do it. Just to remind you, the anti-tamper device, if you find any problem with that, that could be a suspected in product defect or suspected falsification and they should be notified into the HPA. So anti-tampering devices outside the scope of what I am doing so any problems the anti-tampering device you notify them as you usually suspected product quality defect. So how can you prepare for the end of use and learn? Um, first of all make sure your firms and team including your locums are aware of what's going on and what's involved and they're welcome to come to our weekly webinars or they can download the slides recording to on your website. Locums, I would point to in particular, we find repeatedly when we contact firms and locums, they don't know what's going on. So it's really important they know. Now, we've sent details of the webinars to um, the locum agencies. We know Clarity, for example, has it on their website. We encourage them to get the locums to attend. Also, really important, intensify your efforts to prevent alerts. Like the best way to reduce the alert management load is actually to have fewer alerts to deal with. And really that works for all of us. So if you think about my MBO's perspective, if you get two alerts in a pharmacy week and that happens in every pharmacy, we have to deal with all of those alerts. We're very keen also to minimize these alerts. So check your standards working, look out for software issues, upgrade. Sometimes if you upgrade your software or if you upgrade other software in your computer, that can cause problems. And then look at the patterns of double decommissioned alerts and just make sure they're locked in the head. I think it'd be worth start investigating even a small number of alerts. Now, don't wait until the 30th of May, and we're very happy to help you do that. Become familiar with NLBS alerts and give us feedback on your alert investigations. Contact us if you need help with anything or any questions. Please, uh, it would be helpful as you provide us with your preferred email address for alert communications and ideally a generic one. So there's no point giving us an alert, an email of someone who's going to, you know, it works 40 hours a week and the firm's is open 60 hours a week. If you have a generic firm's email address, that's perfect. And then any feedback on how we can improve the process is very welcome. So to summarise in relation to um, end of using learning coming out, I think the big thing is don't panic. If your software and scanner are working as they should and care is taken to avoid double decommission and procedure alerts, you will get very few alerts. If you do get a level five alert, a few quick steps will quickly reveal if there's a root cause at your end. Find an issue with your scanner and software and fix it and supply the pack once you've verified it again. You find a procedural error, double decommission if the pack may be supplied. We would strongly recommend you document your rationale for spending here, but you can't fix these alerts and verify again. They're going to happen again if you do them again. Um, if the alert is due to a data error, the MAH or IMEO, we could quickly pick this up. So if we see lots of alerts in the single MAH spots, we'll be onto them. And we'll ensure that the correct data is uploaded and we'll tell you so you can scan the pack again and go ahead and supply. Contact IMVO if you need support at any time. And from the 30th of May, we will be providing a, a, an out of hours service, eight to eight weekdays, nine to six on Saturday, and 11 to six on Sundays. Now, there may be a limit to how much we can do in terms of MAHs out of hours, because we may simply not be able to get in touch with them, but at least you'll be able to talk to someone who email us if you want to do that. Now, what I want to finish up with very briefly is a little bit about, because I think up until now, everyone has viewed FMD as basically another thing to add to the long list of things that pharmacists have to do with that really don't add any value to anything and just create a lot of passive. What we wanted to start thinking about is there's actually lots of possibilities for this barcode and infrastructure to add value. And this is where I think things will get very interesting once we get out of this user learning phase and we get into steady state, then we can really start to think about the added value piece. So I suppose if I look at all of this, and I, as just as I've mentioned, pharmacies, hospitals, wholesalers, and pharma companies have spent considerable time and funding to implementing barcoding infrastructure to comply with FMD. The tangible benefits are not immediately clear, as the system is primarily designed as deterrent, and very few falsified benefits will ever be detected. But there's a lot of interest in the possibilities across Europe and actual examples of projects underway. So just even looking here in Ireland, if you look at the track facts, I'm sure some of you have heard of this, it's the tracking system that the HSE um, worked with GS1 Ireland to develop. 
It's a GS1 standards based system. So GS1 standards basically they're barcoding standards and all the data in the EMVS is barcoded using GS1 standards. And in fact, what they did was they used the 2D barcodes on the COVID vaccines to identify and track vaccines to the point of vaccination in more than 40 vaccination centres. And I'd recommend you click on that. Like it's a really good story of the HSE coming up, really clever to work in the GS1, really reduced ways to make sure they knew what was going on. Like I know myself, if I walked into a vaccination centre with my appointment card and then my vaccine was waiting for me. And so many people across the country had the same story. We weren't let down in that way. The vaccines were there. And I think it's been a huge success story. And this definitely played a key part in that. One of our colleagues, Maid Magner, MPSI, works for in TCP Pharmaceuticals or TCP Home Care, I think they're called. She presented at a webinar we did last year on how she uses barcode scanning within TCP end to end tracking of all the packs through the dispensary that she has. She logs the dispensed items against the scripts. She records the pharmacist's checks of the dispensary. So she scans the barcodes to do all this. The loading of the orders into the van. So the way they pile stuff into or pack stuff into a tote and knowing where that tote is going, if that's when that's scanned when it goes out to the van, if it's not the right tote for that van, it'll be flagged. So she has literally designed the whole thing to look all along the way. So I'd suggest having a look if you're interested at that link there, which will tell you all about how exactly she's a really interesting presentation. And Maeve in that presentation also talked about um, how barcodes are used by the National Haemophilia Service to track blood products to patient level. Um, that's managed by TCP. And actually what happens is patients actually use an app um, to record when they administer. So you can see all sorts of um, advantages to that. And there's more details available on the link there in Maeve's slides that I mentioned above. Across Europe, then, in Norway, the NMBO is working on a project to streamline recalls. And the concept of this is that instead of the pharmacy or the hospital returning recalled packs to the wholesaler, they just decommission the recalled packs as destroyed, they arrange to have them destroyed, and they send a list to the wholesalers for credit. So it cuts down a lot of the paperwork, but it also cuts down the cost of the van picking it up from the pharmacy and bringing it back to the wholesaler, maybe back to the manufacturer. So environmentally, there's a lot of benefits. Um, our Swedish colleagues were telling us about a thing called Platinia that's going on in Sweden. It's a multi sectoral collaboration platform basically to preserve and enhance the value of existing antibiotics. And they're looking at the possibility of using aggregated data from the EMVS of the Swedish Medicines Verification System to monitor early signals of upcoming shortages. What they would say is we're not seeing lots of antibiotics being uploaded. Then you can actually think, gosh, is this pack going to come short? And you can start to think about preserving use, you know, a limiting use, maybe sourcing other supplies. And one that I think is really interesting is in the UK NHS scan for safety. Um, it's a whole project across the entire um, NHS look, using barcoding technology. And it's it, the basic concept is right patient, right product, right place, right process. It reminds me of when my children respond, they think right child, right place, right time, but it's, you get the idea. It was very interesting in the UK, as they were leaving the EU, and obviously they were going to be leaving the EMVS, there was actually a consultation in the UK about removing the requirement for barcodes of PACS, and actually the feedback was very strong, don't do that, because we now use the barcodes for so many purposes. And particularly as the UK is planning some of our legislation to come, which will reactivate the, you know, the FMD falsification type checks, but for now they're using them for all sorts of processes in the NHS. Interestingly, the European Medicines Agency has recently been given a mandate to deal with medicine shortages and has already been in contact with Envo about the potential use of EMVS to support activity in this area. So other possibilities would include things like scanning to check the PMR against pick out introduced dispensers. These are just some ideas that we've, um, we've been looking at and talking to other colleagues about management of pharmacy level product recalls, management of expired medicines, management of stock levels and inventory digital management of borrowing between pharmacies. You could have scanning logs of what you've lent them and what they've taken from you. So you can see a lot of benefits there. So I'm going to finish with a question. I'm just going to go to my last couple of slides before I do, because I think there's an interesting question at the end. I just want to tell you about we're actually doing a study on added values. We have Grant Thornton working on this at the moment. And the objectives of this are to review how the barcoding infrastructure and mining could be used for purposes other than FMD. We've asked them to look at what's possible using what's currently in place, including the software. Secondly, if extra functionality was added into the software. And then thirdly, if extra functionality was added into the IMBS, for example, things like e functionality. 
We've asked them to assess the benefits financial and otherwise this could bring to pharmacies, wholesalers, NIHs, IMBO members, patients and, pay and payers, and to propose activities for pilot and early subject to agreement of the relevant stakeholders. The final report will be available over the summer, and we're planning to have a conference to launch the report and formally end the end of using early and we move into the next stage of all of this. And we also hope to work with stakeholders to progress pilot projects, identifying where this could be done possibly in conjunction with other like-minded NGOs and ENVIL. Now, we're actually looking for volunteers from the steering committee in to provide guidance and support for this activity and to help us identify which areas we might pilot. If anyone's interested in this, please do get in touch with us. We'd be delighted to have you on that committee. And I've given you just at the very end then just some more information. And I've loads of backup slides, which lost to read a little bit about alert management. And I've also then, as a parting shot, I just thought if you have any other suggestions in relation to added value uses of articles, you might just think about popping them into the chat. So that's basically all I have. It's a fair hop, skip, and a gallop, but hopefully you find it useful. And I see there's loads of questions, and I'm just going to stop sharing all of the questions. That's great, Leonie. Thank you very much. Um, so for those who may have joined us just after the introduction, um, this just to let you know that Leonie will be taking many of the questions, but also here is John Bryan, who is representing the PSI, and he's a head of community pharmacy assurance at the PSI. Um, just so you're aware if there's another voice joining in as well. Um, so Leonie, um, just to try and maybe group some of the, the questions together. Um, there's a question about will returned packs be credited? Do you have any understanding of maybe the process? That's not centers? within scope of what we can do. And in fact, um, because Envo is an interesting organization that has members from all the supply chain, we actually have to be right in, 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 we've been advised from a competition law advice, we can't facilitate discussions between the different stakeholders on commercial terms, including credit for returns. And our alert management guidance re reflects the fact that the delegated regulation doesn't deal with the question of credits. It's a matter to work out between the parties in the same way, for example, if there's a quality defect at the moment, you know, the question of credit will be dealt with between the NIH and the pharmacy. Keep in mind, we anticipate very few packs will have to be returned. Packs will only be returned if you can't find a root cause of injuries or level, or if the NIH hasn't been able to find a data issue and it fix it. So the HPA has said packs are not to be returned unless it gets to the point that the MAH doesn't know what's going on and needs to take the pack back for examination. So the number of packs that will be in that will be minuscule. So there'll actually be very few situations where the credit situation will arise. Okay, thank you. Um, there are kind of two slightly related questions. One is what happens if broadband goes down or there's some issue with access in the system? And then another kind of link to that is kind of maybe some kind of cyber hack issue, yeah. um, something like that where um, it's gonna be difficult to, to carry out the process. Any advice in relation to that? Yeah, certainly um, in relation to broadband going down, what happens is the FMD software is designed to basically, if your broadband goes down and say it can't communicate externally, what it will do is you can continue scanning and you cache the scans and then when the system is back up, they'll, they'll upload again. Um, and if there's an alert at that stage, then you would have to do something, you'd have to identify it. Um, if your whole system is down, there is a provision where you can, um, suppose the internet is working, but your system is down, your FMD software is down, there is a position where you can actually type the data in manually. Now, we don't really recommend it because there's so much data. Our experience is most people type it in wrong. It's like trying to type your password into the computer in the morning. How often do you get that wrong? So I suppose what we found that more and more pharmacies now have better internet because there's so much of a requirement with health mail and with you know all the claiming that they do and communications with wholesale. It's less of an issue now, even though it was three years ago. But that is how it's designed to work. Thank you. Um, question, are ULMs exempted from the FMD activities? I was going to put a couple of slides in about ULMs and then I took them out because it's, a, it's kind of tricky. Yes, in theory they are, but the problem is the European Commission has written a guidance document where they strongly recommend that ULMs sourced from within the EU are scanned. So we've had a lot of discussion with the HPRA about the advice to give the pharmacists on this. And at the moment, we are saying to scan those medicines, but we have seen a problem with some of the HRT products that have come in. And now we're kind of thinking, gosh, if the advice is to scan them, and we know they're going to cause alerts, that's an issue. Certainly, if they come from outside the EU and you see something that looks like a 2D barcode, and don't scan them. And we would have seen the early COVID vaccines, for example, fell into that category, the US or Swiss tax. 
UK packs are really tricky because some of them have data uploaded and some of them don't. So by and large, we'd say don't scan them. Now we're conscious that this is an, and this is one of the problems we have with this type of device. We are very conscious that we're giving an awful lot scan this, don't scan that, you know, and the person's got a 10 item script and the current thing they're trying to work out what to scan, what not to scan. You know, it, it's challenging. So one of the things we're doing is um, we're having discussions across Europe with national competence authorities about putting some functionality into the system to allow us to flag batches that are, might cause alerts so that we can get a better message out to end users who do scan them. So say on licensed medicines with missing data, but um, the national competence authorities have to agree to that across Europe and then it has to be implemented in the system. But it is to try and deal with some of these challenges that we see every day on the ground. So it is one of the trickier parts, um, and we, we do cover a little bit more in our webinars, but it is something we have on the agenda to discuss with the HPA again in the next couple of weeks. What is the best advice to people on this to minimize the amount of hassle and equally to minimize alerts? Okay. Um, a question about is an update to, um, is an up-to-date do not scan list on the IMVO website? I'm not quite sure what Sarah is talking about there. If you want to type clarification, Sarah, that would be um, very welcome. Yeah, um, I suppose there, there are one or two comments earlier up, and I suppose just to acknowledge them about the extra workload that that brings to pharmacy. Um, I, I think you have highlighted the potential future benefits and indeed the current benefits associated with that. But I do want to acknowledge that that is there and I'm not I'm not ignoring that. Oh, yeah, and like we're very conscious of it. And that's one of the reasons why I've really pushed for us to try and start thinking about the added value piece. I know there's been questions about paying for it. And um, I have to say, unfortunately, that's completely outside IMVO's remit. Like we're simply here to set up the system, charge the MAHs to run it and make sure it runs correctly and have people use it. So the question of paying people is not within in any way within our field of endeavor. Um, I am conscious, and I would have been on the PSI Council at the time the consultation rooms were introduced, and I know there was a huge pushback at the time about those. There was a huge, you know, this is costing us a huge amount of money. And they have made a huge amount of things possible in community pharmacy in terms of adequate services. And I think that they're earning their keep now. I would hope that when we get into this added value piece of barcode scanning and tie it in with broader initiatives around greater use of technology and digitalization and e and everything, everything needs to be improved now. We all know that it has huge scope that hopefully then that barcode scan will actually become the key that will unlock lots of other things. So actually there'll be the benefits then that people will see. Certainly I can see that at the moment people don't see it and I completely get that. But unfortunately the question of payment is not something I'm going to be able to fix that one. It's not something that's within our sphere. I don't know if John wants to comment on that one. Right, thanks Fiona. Well, it's, it's obviously outside of our sphere as well. It's, it's, it would be something I think for the Department of Health possibly, but um, uh, we, we've no, we've no remit in regard to it. I would say across Europe, just be aware, pharmacies are not being paid for scanning. They're not paid for FMD. The only situation where we've seen that there is some payment made is some Dutch insurers apparently are paying for pharmacies to do gather its LinkedIn with collection of data around what's being reimbursed. Um, but generally, I, and we've checked this with our colleagues across Europe to see has anyone paid in France. France have made available to pharmacies to try and get them to connect, but they didn't work. The same up in Northern Ireland, that there was some grants made available for infrastructure, but didn't seem to have any impact and uptake of activity. But in other countries, in, based on the survey we had done, other NGOs to see what was going on, the pharmacies were not being paid to comply with the FD legislation. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah's come back with clarification. Um, at the beginning, there was a list of certain IV solutions, particularly ATC code items that could not be scanned. Has this list changed or evolved? We didn't put that list up, Sarah. I think that was done by the HPAI because what happens is there's an annex in the delegated regulation that says it's out of scope and they define the various IV fluids by ATC code. Now, we don't have any competence within IMVO in relation to what's available in pharmacies. And I think the HPAI have worked on that. Um, so that might be the port of call um, to look into that to see has that list been updated. Certainly, the annex hasn't changed in relation to IV fluid. So if that list was correct at the time, the only change would be anything new that's come on the market or gone off the market since then. Um, I'm going to end the recording um, at the moment. I'm, I am going to come back to these questions, but um, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, and it's not included. Can I just comment, if I might, 
um, will I and VO and um, there's a comment here about the scanning that the point is supplied to patients by community pharmacies so like, I want to address this point because there seems to be a perception out there that if people complain loudly enough we can give a go ahead and scan whenever you want we can't it's European legislation it's written in a piece of European legislation the only way that requirement can be changed is to change the legislation I think realistically is it going to be changed I think no I think I have to be entirely honest about it. I think um, there was a lot of, I, from what I understand back in the early days, there was a lot of arguments made that it, there should be more flexibility, but that was not given by the Commission at the time. So in my view, we just simply implement what we're given in terms of legislation. So the original FMD is 11 years old. The delegated regulation is now six years old. It may be it reviewed at some point, but would it go away from this requirement? I doubt very much that it will. I want to be completely realistic and honest about it. You know, I might just come in there on that, and, and I'll agree with you. And I mean, <clears throat> from PSI's point of view, I, this is law. It's enshrined in law and has been for a number of years. We also see it as a patient safety issue. And it <laughs> does provide, from our perspective, it does provide uh, a, a safe environment for patients. It is preventing, um, it is preventing false fake medicines entering the system. And, and I think that's the view we have of it. And I, I don't think there's any, uh, there's, there is no, there is no, um, no one kind of looking at this with a view to, uh, to, to dispensing with the, uh, with the whole FMD system. It is what it is. I think part of the problem we have is that the use and learn, which when we, when we agreed to have a use and learn, we were talking about months. Unfortunately, it's, it's dragged on because of COVID and because of Brexit. And I think I, I, it, it would, the actual system just didn't happen. And it is only going to happen now on the 30th of May. But I think after that, people might get better used to it. Um, but it is law and it's enshrined and it's enshrined across Europe. And the idea is to prevent falsified medicines uh, and dispense to patients. And, and I think everyone buys into that. Um, and, and that's the way it is going forward.